Hi everyone and welcome to today's kitchen session, Risk Assessment and Understanding, working with people with mental health problems. So today's session will be de delivered by Wayne Conniscale. He's the Senior Lecturer and Deputy Programme Leader for Mental Health Nursing. I'm Abby and I'm a Higher Education Advisor here at the University of Chester. Um, and I'm also here with my colleagues Vicky and Hayley and they'll both be helping out behind the scenes today. So I just want to start by reassuring you that your video and audio, they won't be shared um, during the course of this session. Um, so in terms of how today will work, um, so I'll shortly be handing um, over to Wayne, um, but during the presentation, you'll be able to ask questions in the chat function. So that's on the right hand side of the screen. Um, you can ask questions anonymously if you wish. So you just need to make sure that you tick the box to say that you wish to be anonymous. Um, you can also like other questions that other people post um, and you can also answer any questions that may that Wayne might ask um, during the presentation um, also in the chat function. Um, so Hayley will ask Wayne um, everybody's questions at the end of the session. Um, so I think that's everything from me. So over to you, Wayne. Thanks, Abby. Thanks ever so much. Um, so great to, to have so many of you on the call and um, it's uh, what I'm going to do um, is give you an overview uh, to start with. But firstly, my, my, my title, Wayne Connor Scarhill, Senior Mental Health Lecturer at the University of Chester. But I do work at different campuses across the University of Chester as well. So risk assessment and understanding. And, I, and, I, and I've purposely split those words up because what I want you to try and get an understanding of is it's not just risk as in danger and safety. It's about risk in and of itself. The assessment of people and patients and service users with mental illness and also developing an understanding as well. So trying to think about what we mean by understanding people's mental health problems. Um, and I'm, I'm welcome to my kitchen. This is actually my kitchen and I'm going to try and use the environment that I live in to try and give you an, a, an experience or an example of what it might be like and why it might be useful when you're pe visiting people in their own homes as a mental health nurse or as a psychiatric nurse. OK, so how do we assess people in emotional and mental distress? How do we do it? Why do we do it? And I think that there are questions that I'm going to kind of pose to you because I'm hoping that one of the reasons you're on this call, either you or one of your loved ones, one of your family members, you're interested in the idea of studying maybe at the University of Chester, maybe somewhere else but you're interested in studying the subject of mental illness. Perhaps you're thinking about doing mental health nursing. Um, and, and I wanna kind of try and generate some interest in the subject from you. And one of the ways I can generate interest is by probably posing more questions than answers. And it'll, it'll, it'll encourage in you interest, dialogue, and maybe go away and read further and explore further. OK, so I maybe should give you a little bit of, a bit of a background as to as why you should listen to me, why you, know, why you should trust what I say. Well, I've been a nurse now for, wow, 30 years. So I qualified in 1993 at St Thomas's down in London. And I worked in a variety of clinical areas up until about three years ago. So even though I teach at the university full time, I've got about 25, 28 years of clinical practice. So that works in areas such as psychiatry. I worked on the streets of London for about eight years, uh, working in South London around the river, working with homeless, mentally ill people from all over the world, from all over the country. And that lent itself to me developing a really, I think, a fairly robust understanding of what we mean by mental illness and mental health. So we'll go a little bit through how we assess people who have emotional and mental distress. Let's have a little think, though, um, for a moment about the kind of questions that you may ask people when you when you're working with them. And you may be sitting at home now thinking, I couldn't be a mental health nurse. I couldn't be an adult nurse. I couldn't be a children's nurse or a learning disability nurse because it just seems too big. 
And I think one of the things we try to, 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 to teach our students at the university, whether they're first, second or third year, or engaging in some of the access programmes, we try to get them to realise that you don't just go from zero years experience to 30 years experience and know, think you know it all, because you never know it all. But you actually have to take quite a stepped approach. OK, you have to, first of all, come on calls like this and start to find out a little bit about whether this subject is an interesting subject for you. OK, so if we just think about for a moment, if you were speaking to a friend of yours or a family member of yours and you were wanting to elicit or find out from them how they were from a mental health perspective, just for a moment, think about the kind of questions that you might ask. And they are simple questions sometimes. Questions like, how are you? How do you feel? How are things being for you today? Uh, what have you been up to? And what these very simple questions, it's not rocket science, science often, it's simple questions that allow you to link in with a human being that allows them to feel comfortable so they share information with you. And it's not just the types of questions we ask, i.e. the what we ask. It's the how we ask the questions and having an understanding about why I'm asking a certain question of a person. And what I always talk to students about, and I'm just thinking here, have I got any example of it? I sometimes will have a, a, a clear board behind me, but if you imagine a clear wall or even a frame of a picture with nothing in it, I often say to students and to families and to patients and to people that what I might need to try and do by asking these questions is to start to paint a picture of who you are and to develop an understanding of, 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 of who you are and then to start to get a felt sense of what it's like to have emotional and mental distress. Because you like me and everyone else on this call, we all have uh, mental health issues to a greater or lesser extent. We all do. And that goes without exception. So we all will wake up some mornings and for whatever reason, we don't feel ourselves. We don't feel energetic, uh, positive. We feel um, something's not quite right. We can't put our finger on it. OK, so we think about the types of questions we ask people. And I think when you when you often talk to patients and to family members when you're thinking about their mental health problem you often try to what people often do is they engage in what we call problem free talk or they try to because most of us most people you talk to have a focus on problems services are set up to focus on problems. You can't go to your GP and arrange an appointment with your GP because you're feeling great, can you? You go to your GP because you've got a problem. And what patients often want to talk about is how overwhelmed they are by problems. So we sometimes talk to them about solutions. It's not to, to diminish or to ignore the experiences that they have, the emotional, mental distress that they have, but it's trying to elicit from them some of the times in their lives when these problems haven't been present. And if we focus on what we call solution focused therapy or solution focused interventions, then we start to look at things that people can do to resolve their own issues. So if I just for a moment asked you all to identify privately, of course, one issue that you feel you have in your life. Just simple, something, it could be something fairly like me. I always like, I do a lot of exercise, but I'd like to do more. I sometimes don't eat that well. I'd like to eat healthier. Uh, I sometimes think I'd like to be more sociable, especially at the moment, COVID-19. Wouldn't we all like to be more sociable? But whatever your issue is, just have a little think about that. Conceptualize that problem. And it may be that you don't feel very happy. It could be something a bit more serious like that. And then what we do with patients and people is we ask them to just simply score themselves on a scale of 0 to 10. You'd have done it. 0 being the, the unhappiest you felt, or 10 being the happiest, or 0 being when you're really not eating healthily, and 10 when you're really healthy. 
where would you score yourself today? And you get people to start to self reference and give, a, give themselves a score. So some people might say, I feel seven. I just feel seven out of 10. And most people would ideally like to be at 10. They'd all, most of us would like to be up at that, that neck of the woods. But sometimes we have to have a dose of reality as well. So where would you be happy with? And, and a lot of people might say, well, I'd be happy with nine. And so what you ask, what you ask patients then, type of question that engages in them describing the solution. And I could ask you it of your issue. What would being at that ideal number look like? And with people that you're working with, you ask them to tell you what that looks like. So being less distressed or being less depressed or being uh, well, tell me about that. Just talk to me about that. And some people find it really difficult to talk about solutions and to describe uh, what things would be like. And sometimes you'll say to them with them sitting next to you, uh, you would say, if I were watching you on a video, if I were watching you on a video, what would I see differently if you were happier? Uh, and people can sometimes explain that because that's easier. It's, it's like almost depersonalized, so you can talk about something else, even though it's you you're talking about. Or sometimes you can even ask them, if your mother was here or your father was here or your wife or your sister or your brother was here, somebody that they respect, what would they say you need to do differently? And again, that's another example of what people can, people start to tell you the answers to their problems when you take that approach. But of course, the types of questions we ask people can sometimes be really, really uh, difficult. And I wouldn't expect any of you potential mental health nurses or whatever field to know and deal with some of these, these risky type uh, patients and people. So sometimes we have to ask dangerous questions, difficult questions, challenging questions. And, and sometimes we have to talk to people about whether they feel they want to be alive. And that's a pretty significant question to ask somebody. So there's a way in which we would ask that type of difficult question is that we would start more generalist. So we just say, introduce the subject to a patient such as, I'd like to talk to you more about um, just keeping you safe and, and how you how you perceive the world around you. And then you gently and eventually you hone in on the idea because they're painting you the picture, you hone in on the idea of uh, whether they've ever thought about taking their own life. Really powerful questions that for some people they've never been asked it before. And then we get into the, and I won't go into it today because we haven't got time of course, but you then get into the difference and the complexities of suicidal ideas and suicidal intent two very different things, but two things that are very closely connected. I'd like to talk a little bit about when you're on the programme here at the University of Chester, how we how we teach you and um, the kind of experiences that you'd have with regards to, to mental health problems. And also mental illness. You would have an experience where you'd work with people in mental health inpatient units. And of course, I've got fairly extensive experience of working in inpatient units, but you'd also have experiences sometimes of working with people in their home. So here we are in my kitchen um, here in Chester. I do live in the well, nearly the centre of Chester. And I think when you're in, a, in an inpatient unit, obviously somebody's in hospital because their mental health has gotten to such a state of, of dis-ease. And you notice I'm not very medical there. I'm using breaking the word down, not disease dis-ease is to go to such a state that they need to be in hospital potentially and probably for their own safety and in hospital it's a very different environment most hospitals now mental health units you have your own bed you have your own room and you often have ensuite shower facilities i'm not trying to paint a picture here of it's like a hotel it's anything but but when you're in hospital working with patients and if you were a student nurse you'd be on placement potentially in these places it's a very different type of conversation than you would have if you were working with people in their home. So you may ask yourself, so I'm going to visit somebody in their home. How am I going to assess risk? And why am I going to assess risk? And what I'm going to try and do, and I'm hoping that this, that this will work 
reasonably well. I'm just going to look around my own kitchen and give you a kind of some examples of why visiting somebody at home would help to be able to understand risk and also their mental health. Uh, and I'll come, I think, a little bit in a little while to the difference between mental health problems and mental illness. I'll maybe talk to them a little bit. And that's my dishwasher in the background, and just in case you're, you're wondering what that noise is, it's not my tummy. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is just briefly talk about in the kitchen, if I'm visiting a patient uh, or if you're visiting a patient in their home with a community mental health nurse or a district nurse or a Macmillan nurse, you can come into somebody's home and you can immediately see if it's a young person or it's an older person, you can see that there's an environment here that will give you give you some insight into the way that they uh, the way that they function in their life. Now, um, my wife knew that I was going to do a live lecture, so she insisted that our kitchen has been really tidy. So this is our kitchen really tidy. But you'll notice as well that with some people, you would visit them and the, the, the untidiness, the mess of their house, will give you a real insight into, into their state of mind, potentially. Not definitely, but potentially. So there are things, for example, if I were to, if I were to put my cooker on, if I'm putting my cooker on, you don't necessarily see that in this image, but the hob is running. And with, with older people, for example, or people who have some kind of brain injury, or people with certain types of psychosis who lose their sense of reality, they could easily forget basic and fundamental safety things like leaving a cooker on, leaving a hob on. They could leave the gas running if they had an older type of cooker that just left the gas running. So there's, there's indications that you could do assessments within somebody's home uh, watching them prepare or cook a meal. So then, of course, there are other things. If you're thinking about safety of, of children, um, I'm not going to be all scary and get the knife out of the, out of the cutlery drawer, drawer, but, you know, if there's children in the house, as a nurse, we're, we, are, we have a responsibility towards not just the patient, but also to the patient's family. And we have to try and juggle uh, interfering and over-involving ourselves with families but also helping families and we have a responsibility towards uh, the children of those of those parents if for example the parents are our patients so there are there are lots of examples within your own kitchen that give you an insight into into um whether somebody's functioning at a high level or whether somebody's really really struggling we face many risks in mental health services. We face some really challenging uh, people. I mentioned earlier on, I think, in the talk that that when I was working in the, I used to work with refugees landed in, in the country and they become fleeing places like the Middle East, parts of Africa, where they'd had their families uh, killed in front of them, traumatised people. They'd land at Heathrow and that one of the first people they'd speak to with a translator or an interpreter would be somebody like me who try to assess their level of safety and try to support them from a social perspective. And so those levels of complexity, of potential risk when somebody's lost everything, not just their family, their, their belongings, uh, their homeland, their identity, they can't even speak the language of the country they've landed in. Can you even imagine for a moment the desperation that somebody would feel? And what we have to do as mental health nurses um, is we, we have to hold, we have to imagine, metaphorically, I guess, we're holding somebody's stress and that has a big impact on us. So whether you're assessing people's risk, whether you're trying to understand uh, how they're, can, how engaged they are or not within the work you're doing, you have to sometimes try and hold um, their anxieties, their stresses, their distress. OK, now I mentioned before the difference between mental health and mental illness. Mental health is something we all have. We all have degrees of anxiety, of mood changes, of depression within normal brains. But then there is also more severe and endure mental illness, sometimes referred to unhealthy as SMI within the field of psychiatry. But they uh, are much more serious, potentially but not always. So things like schizophrenia, psychosis, which are not the same thing, but they're slightly connected but different. Bipolar affective disorder, severe depressions uh, and, and, and dementia 
and so on. And I'll leave you to kind of explore those and, and get excited about those in a bit more detail uh, in your own in your own time. Um, so I think I've mentioned a little bit about risk and working with with people who have either uh, ideas about hurting themselves and how we maybe um, work with that, ask difficult questions rather than just ask a blunt, abrupt question of somebody. We try to kind of focus in on it. So that's about communication skills and self-awareness. Um, I think I probably covered a fair amount. I'm looking at the time now, I'm thinking it's about 20 past, so probably coming to a natural end. So I think I've looked at risk as in as much as I can in 20 minutes, looked at assessment, um, and, and then looked at risk assessment and trying to help give you a little taste for what it's like to, to work with people who have mental health problems, but also uh, what it might be like if you're in the classroom with, with, with me and with my colleagues, how we would go about teaching you some of those things. So we do smaller group work, large group work. Obviously at the moment, there's lots of online learning. So I should stop there um, and I'll hand over back home to my colleagues and see whether there are any questions and I'll happily do my best to, to answer them. Wow, that was such a fascinating talk. Thanks, Wayne. I feel like you covered quite a breadth of different areas and we've had some really great questions come in as well, um, which just shows how much people are engaging um, with what you've just spoken about. So I'll start off with the first one that came in. So do you think the COVID-19 pandemic will alter the role of mental health nurses? Perhaps there will be more of a demand. Yeah, what a great question, I agree. Um, so I think there already is. I think with COVID-19, and I admit it myself online, on Teams, on Zoom, we all have these Zoom calls with our family and our friends. It's become our new best pal, hasn't it? Zoom and FaceTime and whatever else. And I think that that as a community, as a society, as a nation and as a world, it has impacted our mental well-being so significantly uh, beyond beyond what we really know at the moment. Um, I think I I personally and lots of people I know really struggle with the isolation, but we, we as human beings are quite adaptable. And I found that between May and, um, and March and May, I had to adapt to working from home. Um, and so I think if, if people who haven't got mental illness, mental health problems are affected, and we all are, and it's normal to be affected, then I think that must have a, a knock-on effect and change to the role of both the healthcare workers, the NHS staff, social care staff, social workers, and all our medical colleagues and all professionals. So it will undoubtedly have an effect on the role of the of the nurse, the mental health nurse. And I'll, I'll finish on this particular point. I, I, I have no doubt it has changed because I know it's changed. Many of my colleagues who are in clinical practice now, um, they are doing a lot more of their work, their connections with patients and with people online to minimise the risk. And there is something positive about that as well. It means we can potentially use our resources in a slightly different way without getting too political or economic to see more people. So if I was seeing 10 people in a day in, in, in when I was clinical only three and a half years ago, I would spend two or three hours of my day travelling from A to B to C to D. And sometimes patients wouldn't be in. If I contacted them on Zoom or on whatever, whatever means and they weren't in, saving a lot of time. So I could go on forever, as you probably can tell by now, but I won't. Uh, I, I think, yeah, undoubtedly it's changed. Brilliant, thank you. Um, on to the next question. Um, with talking being so valuable in understanding others' mental health, what happens when talking is too difficult? Are there any other ways? Yeah, that's a, again, brilliant question, because because I think uh, I'll give you an example. I'll, I'll answer that question by giving a, a clinical example from my own experience on the ground. I spent many years working with with young people having their first episode of psychosis, both in Wirral and in West Cheshire and of course in London historically, but focused particularly on people with first episode of psychosis. Who quite often people like that are, are, are quite suspicious um don't maybe have the ability to talk and and i think as the question articulated really well don't want to talk can't talk 
So sometimes I would allow, I would ask uh, people that I work with, would you prefer me to speak to your family? Would you prefer to talk to me by text? Would you prefer to email me? Or would you prefer to, for me just to answer your questions without asking you anything? So there are different ways that we can encourage people to engage in communication. It's not just verbal. And I would probably just add to that as a final point um, that, that people can, can, can express themselves in many other ways too. So when I used to work in a drug and alcohol detox unit in Stockwell in London, uh, we used to have art therapy and we used to have get, get people recovering from predominantly heroin and crack addiction to draw pictures to express themselves and to be able to kind of explain how and who and what they were by using art as a medium. Of course, people can write music, people can write songs, people write poetry, and sometimes these give a much more powerful uh, sort of communication to us. And even we even use poetry and, 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 um, and, and storytelling within our program of nursing that encourages our students to connect to working with people with mental distress, but by using different parts of the brain. Mm. Yeah, I think, like you mentioned, it's very important to think about how someone else is processing thoughts because everyone's not processing thoughts in the same way. So it's yeah. about developing that understanding. Um, great question. What's the difference between a mental health nurse and a psychologist? OK, so I think I'll probably answer the question a, a little bit differently. So if you go for psychologists and psychiatrists, so a psychiatrist is somebody who works with people with um, um, uh, uh, mental illness. Um, but the psychologist and people who are who are acting unusually uh, and a psychologist works, tries to explain more normal behaviour, human behaviour. And I mean, there's a big interchange between what a psychiatrist does and a psychologist does, and there's a lot of crossover. And similarly, uh, for me as a mental health nurse or many of my colleagues, we work in a psychological way. So, for example, me as a mental health nurse, I've been trained in quite a lot of psychological interventions, which would be stereotypically regarded as the psychologist role. So I'm trained to work with families and delivering family interventions. I'm trained to deliver cognitive behavioural therapy, uh, not to, to work with patients and people to think about, about their thoughts, their feelings, their behaviour. And so the, the kind of the more stereotypical role of the psychiatrist, the psychologist and the mental health nurse of maybe the 70s and the 80s has become a lot more fluid, um, a little bit like the role of the nurse and the social worker uh, has become a lot more kind of interchange. So um, essentially a psychologist looks at normal behaviour and tries to understand it and a psychiatrist looks at abnormal behaviour and try, possibly tries to treat it but that's me being a very very generalist answer. Brilliant, thank you. A um, couple more questions. So do you find that patients may behave differently at home as opposed to a clinical environment, so in a hospital? Without question, there's no doubt about that. I mean, I, I, I haven't mentioned um, I was going to talk about it and then I thought I thought whether I should or not. But I often talk about my own brother. My own brother had a, has had many admissions to hospital uh, under section of the Mental Health Act. He's my younger brother, um, even though he's about six foot two, he's still my little brother. Uh, he's a bit bigger than me, I can guarantee you that. And um, when he's in hospital, because he's also autistic, it's incredibly distressing for him. Um, when you're in hospital, often you see people in a very clinical sense. It's a bit like a kid at school. You see them with a uniform on. They look like everybody else. When you go to somebody's home, and I remember going to a home, at somebody's home, I'd seen him in hospital. He did really well. He recovered really well. And when I went to his home, um, I realised that he was living in utter poverty. And his brother answered the door and he was clearly on some kind of drugs. And he answered the door to me knocking to see him. And his brother shouted up to my patient, so that an 18 year old lad who just recovered from having a mental illness, he shouted upstairs, the guy from the nut house is here to see you. So can you imagine for a moment how important it is for us to see our people and our patients and our service users in their home environment, the reality of their lives? 
And we know that this happens. My wife is a, has been a Macmillan nurse, a hospice nurse. She goes to some people's homes and it's a very different presentation because when you're in hospital, you're treated the same, you're fed. Many people in our world, many people in our country are not fed. Many of our children, you can think about the wonderful work that Marcus Rashford does. Many of our children don't get breakfast. So seeing them in their home is so important and not assuming too much just because of how they present in hospital. So it's very different, yeah, very different. And this sort of links on to the next um, question. Is there anything in place to ensure nurses are safe when they go into homes? Yeah, so we have many, many well, certainly as a student nurse, you'd always be working with somebody. So you'd always go in um, uh, with a colleague. We have a lone worker policy within all organisations. So as you can imagine, I was working on the, on the streets of London in homelessness. I was a little bit more vulnerable than most, you can say. So walking around the streets of London, sometimes at 6.30 in the morning, you know, you'd be a bit vulnerable, especially in the middle of winter, it's pitch black. It can be a bit of a scary place, although I quite found it quite exciting. Um, but but what we do is we we let each other know where we're going. We let each other know when the session's going to start and stop. Uh, thankfully, we've all got mobile phones now, but in the early 90s, night phone, mobile phones only came in in the 90s. Not everyone had a phone until about 95, 96, 97, believe it or not. Some of you weren't born then, but that's the reality. So we would have to um, let colleagues know where we are. But also, we never put ourselves in a position of unnecessary risk where we know somebody's dangerous, uh, for example. And we do sometimes know that when people get very ill, they can become dangerous, although they're much more likely to be a risk to themselves. So we have to kind of measure that and calculate it and consider it as a team. You're never working on your own. You do it with colleagues and we make very considered decisions about going to see people in their home. There are occasions when people change. But that's why we're, we're assessed, we're, we're trained in managing that risk and reacting to that risk. So as a very, very brief example, we might go into somebody's home. We'd always sit by the door so we can get out if we need to. Although that doesn't really, that, 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 that doesn't, I'm not trying to scare people because that really isn't the case very often. No, you, it's definitely reassuring because you're saying that you're working together as a team and somebody always knows where you are. Yeah. Um, we've got one final question. Um, so how do you advise looking after your own mental health while being a mental health nurse? Well, as a mental health nurse, I think it's probably very similar to how I would advise the people I see. I sometimes still see people who as patients, service users, call it what you will. Um, and I think I, I think a nice place to go to is just look up if you want to go and Google it, five ways to well-being. And I'm, I'm, you caught me out now, I'm probably not going to remember all of them, but they, they are things like, I mean, when I struggled with my own mental health, I really struggled with it when I was in mid twenties, I found things difficult and I took up running. And I, I think, no, I was probably about 30, actually 32. I took up running and I think exercise, you know, this phrase, you are what you eat. Um, relationships, getting out, seeing people, being with people, it's my dishwasher again, um, being with people and engaging with the world around you and doing things that make you think differently and reading, but the five ways to well-being, look it up and it'll give you all of these kind of pointers because we all, whether we're mental health nurses or whatever we are, we can always do things that will improve um, our mental well-being. So your five senses, Think about your five senses. You know, for some of you it might seem a bit odd, but I like I, I like the idea. I love meditating. I don't do it often enough, but to meditate and focus on your own breathing and let your troubles kind of just slip away, and then reset yourself ten minutes later, twenty minutes later. It's not a million miles away from the effects you get when you go for a long walk, or when you go for a run, or when you go uh, you go out for a nice meal with friends. You do something different. You do something different. So five ways to well-being would be my pointer. Oh, great. I think that's a great way to end um, the question. So it's back over to Abby. Thank you very much, Wayne. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, both. Um, so that is everything um, for today's session, everyone. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. And also thank you so much to Wayne for such an interesting presentation. Um, I think it's just such an important topic um, as well. Um, so we hope you all enjoyed the session and we hope you all found it useful.
Um, we are running um, many more kitchen sessions, so do double check the schedule on the website and sign up for any others that you are interested in. Thank you.